Hello, I'm Brooks Lyles, the chairman of the Education Committee of the National Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. We are pleased to have with us here today for the first of what we hope will be many uh, 250th anniversary author interviews, David O. Stewart of Potomac, Maryland. When David and I talked the other day, he said to introduce him as a former lawyer who writes books. While he is that, he is a bit more too. Uh, David is a best-selling writer of history and nonfiction. His books, Summer of 1787, The Men Who Invented the Constitution, is a stirring and timely narrative of the formation of the U.S. Constitution. His other histories have explored the gifts of James Madison, the outrageous Western expedition and treason trial of the mysterious Aaron Burr, and the impeachment trial of President Andrew Johnson. He has won the Washington Writer Award for Best Book of the Year, the History Prize of the Society of Cincinnati, and the William H. Prescott Award of the National Society of Colonial Dames of America. The Wall Street Journal called George Washington, The Political Rise of America's Founding Father, an outstanding biography with writing that is clear, often superlative, and a narrative drive such a life deserves. David is here today to speak with us about America's Founding Father, George Washington. David? Thanks very much for having me. Uh, I just to sort of give a little overview of the book, I, my focus on Washington came, uh, I, I've written other books on the founding and it just seemed like he was such, so much the central figure that I was missing the point. I needed to deal with Washington and understand him. And I got very bemused by this fact that he won four key elections in his career. He was elected commander in chief of the Continental Army. He was elected president of the Constitutional Convention. He was elected president twice. And of course he won those elections, but he won them unanimously. And that's, that's a neat trick. And it was a neat trick back in the 18th century. So I wanted to understand that better, why and how he was able to make that happen. And I, I found some things that surprised me. Uh, it was not an easy success. We tend to think of Washington as this big solemn guy who everybody kowtowed to and who just cruised to um, greatness. And it wasn't like that at all. Um, he was the third son of a uh, planter of the second rank in Virginia. Uh, being the third son was not a good spot. Uh, his father died when he was 11 and he didn't get very good assets. Um, he had a very short education, just a couple of years, because there wasn't enough money to pay for it. His, his mom was left as a single mother um, with five little kids. Uh, he set out for a military career, and in the French and Indian War, there were formative experiences. Uh, he was a young man. He was just 20 when, basically, he was engaged in the actions that started it. And he had a couple of very good innings. And then he had basically three terrible years uh, leading the Virginia regiment out in the frontier, uh, fighting the French and the Indians, mostly the Indians, which was the problem. Uh, the Virginia soldiers, the white Virginian soldiers were not any good fighting in the woods. And the Indians grew up in the woods and they were brilliant wilderness fighters. And it really wasn't Washington's fault, but he basically had a bad day every day for those three years. And the worst thing that happened was it soured him. He became very impatient. He was an ambitious young man. He was an ambitious man his whole life. Uh, and he got very sharp, ultimately insulting towards his superiors. Uh, towards the Virginia colonial governor who had showed him great favors. And by the time he resigns from the military in 1758, he has really fouled the nest. Um, he is not going to have a military career and um, he's turning the page. You can see that in his actions. And it's an interesting uh, change in direction uh, for someone as ambitious as he who had set out on this one path and he decides, well, that's not gonna work. And he moves to chapter two and he decides on a political career, which was, you can tell, not his first instinct. Uh, 
He also marries Martha Custis, which is a very smart thing to do because she's a very wealthy widow. She has inherited her husband, first husband's assets, which were extensive. And that's very important to Washington's success as well. Um, and he enters politics. He spends 16 years in the Virginia colonial legislature, the House of Burgesses. He's, he's a legislator uh, much longer than he served as an army officer. Uh, he spends a decade on the parish vestry, which in Virginia in those times, the, the parish actually had governmental responsibilities. Uh, they took care of the poor, they took care of some land issues, and Washington was responsible for that. Uh, he spent six years on the county court in Fairfax County, which was his home. And that was terribly important because it sounds like a judicial activity, which it was in part, but what it was much more an administrative duty. He was always very good at administration. Uh, and it was responsible for building the roads, making sure that they got built, uh, licensing ferries, uh, licensing taverns, uh, uh, running the tobacco warehouses that manage the export trade. It was a very important job. And those of us who have ever seen local government close up know that it's, it's a tough job because these are usually issues people care about a great deal, uh, often much more than uh, the great issues of, of state. And I think through all of these experiences over that 16 year period, when I, I tend to refer to them sometimes as his wilderness years, um, he's not a national figure. He's not uh, building a huge reputation, but he is building a Virginia reputation and he's learning great skills. And the skills he learns are those we see through his mature career. Um, he always had great energy, remarkable energy. He wore people out with his ability to work. Um, he made true judgments, very much a, a, a judge of people, and of their talents. Uh, he had a, an eye for horse flesh. And he also uh, would balance issues. One of his flaws as an early army commander had been, uh, he would go with his first instinct on decisions. He would make up his mind very quickly. Uh, at this point, uh, by the end of this wilderness period, he's not doing that anymore. He wants to hear what smart people think he should do. He doesn't always do what they tell him. Uh, he makes up his own mind, but he wants to hear. And that's a characteristic for the rest of his career, both as a soldier and then as a political leader. He, I think, naturally had what John Adams called the gift of silence. Um, and it's an unusual form of political leadership. We think of leaders as being people like Churchill or Franklin Roosevelt to give great speeches and inspire people. But Washington was not a very good orator and he knew it. And so he became a world-class listener and he gave people a sense that they were being heard in a way that mattered to them. And it was a way to build a connection with them that I think was extraordinarily important. Uh, and one of the qualities I wasn't expecting to find in him was his emotional accessibility. Uh, he was, that his contemporaries called him affable. Um, he was pleasant to be around. You know, they, all of his portraits tend to be pretty stern, at least as an older man. Uh, but he was not like that in person. And it, it he was, gifted at connecting with people. It's, it's a hard thing to describe about someone who's been dead for more than 200 years, but you can see it in the way he is received. Um, I was struck that on at least two occasions, uh, he wept in public. This is not something we associate with great leaders, but he wasn't ashamed. Uh, he was moved. And I think it drew people to him that he had that you know, visibility that he was able to, to show how much he was feeling on that occasion. Now, after canvassing that, the book turns to five sort of key challenges he faced in his mature career. And I'm just gonna skim over them uh, quickly here. First is his army leadership. And I just focused 
on Valley Forge, where he had terrible problem developing congressional support, which he was able to do, even though he hadn't won a battle for more than a year, and he'd lost a couple. So that was a that was a that was a, a heavy lift, as we might say today. Um, he also was able to resist um, a, an effort to remove him as commander in chief, uh, which was led by. Uh, uh, several army officers, Horatio Gates and uh, Thomas Mifflin. It was called the Conway Cabal. Uh, he outflanked them and really uh, left them gasping. <laughs> and then he had to win a, a battle. You, you, uh, you can't run an army that long without winning. And he, he was able to do that at the Battle of Monmouth. And I think that's a, really a pivotal uh, battle that tends to not get the attention it should. The second stage is the transition to peacetime, which was terribly important. He resigns from the army and goes home, which is a brilliant political move. I think it was genuine. He wanted to go home, but it earned him the trust of everybody. And he always had a great gift for winning trust, but giving up power persuaded almost all Americans that they could trust him. He wasn't desperate to hang on to power. In fact, he was glad to go home. Uh, there was terrible drift in the country under, in this period. We had the worst economic depression we've ever had, worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s. And that brought him back into politics, or into politics, perhaps I should say, on a national level. He was a national figure from the war. And he was, the, I think, the single essential delegate to the Constitutional Convention. He was the president there. He he, he presided over the whole four months of the convention. He was essential to the ratification fight through all the states, which was not an easy fight. And I don't have any reluctance in saying that if he had not been engaged in that, it's a very open question whether we would have had a constitution and whether the government would have fallen apart. The third step is establishing the new government. Very important, obviously, to create all these new precedents, uh, to establish the office of the presidency, which he did. He established a financial system, determined where the national capital would go, established the Bank of the United States. But again, an under-recognized moment is the Whiskey Rebellion, which was a tax revolt. Uh, and he was able to put it down by bringing overwhelming force, establishing the right of the government to tax, and also then pardoning everybody who had led it. Uh, and it won uh, great support for the government. The fourth step was the neutrality policy that kept us out of the European war that was breaking out between France and England, um, and which roiled our politics for many years. And he correctly decided that the country couldn't afford to be have anything to do with it after all of the trouble and loss of the revolution. And the final challenge was, of course, slavery. And it, it's a bittersweet uh, part of the book. Uh, he came to appreciate the horror of slavery and the crime of his engagement in it. He, he tried his best to fight to, to get himself out of it. Um, but it, you know, the times weren't right. He didn't figure it out as well as he would have wished. And it was a failure of the whole country. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, good oversight. Uh, we were able to solicit uh, our membership for some questions. And we're going to go through that series of questions. And the first is from compatriot Mark Anthony of the Georgia Society. Mark's question is, given the history of shortened lifespans within the male Washington line and the actual experience of George Washington in surviving the battles in both the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War, where bullets tore his clothing, can these competing life experiences be seen as a direct influence on Washington's political rise and outlook for the United States? Well, they're certainly part of his history and have an, had an impact. Um, he was uh, given to gloomy statements about mortality and his impending death, which so many of his 
family did die young. Uh, he re referred somewhat memorably to death as the Grim King. Uh, but he, uh, I think I would emphasize the, the battle experiences, uh, not because they directly lead into uh, uh, in, any quality that mattered to him as a politician, but it did frame him in how people thought of him. And there is something special about a person who can face death bravely and calmly. Um, and Washington had that quality. At at least two battles, the Battle of the Monongahela during the French and Indian War, and then the uh, Monmouth Battle, uh, he was the guy on horseback. He was the tallest man in the place. And he just did his job. And he, he acted as though that's all that mattered. And he showed extraordinary courage. Everybody who was at either place was totally impressed with that. And that is something we respect as a people. Um, courage, I was recently reading Winston Churchill saying at the end of the day, the thing we judge leaders most on is their courage. And I think with Washington, he never had to answer that question after those battles. Um, it also cloaked him in a certain mythical quality. And there were myths around him. I think we're going to get to that. Um, but he faced these terrible risks and never had a scratch. And that was pretty remarkable. Um, something I would also emphasize, though, about his experiences in, in the military was the extent to which he commanded the loyalty of the men. He even did in the French and Indian War when he was not a very successful general or leader, but the men were generally uh, trusted him. Again, he inspired loyalty in the uh, Revolutionary War as well. And there's one quote from a French soldier that I find powerful, which is, it was as though he was every man's father or brother. He, he cared in Valley Forge, you can see, you know, if he, every day he rode through camp and, you know, if there were horse carcasses that needed to be moved, he, he had them moved. I mean, he, he cared about everything about his men and that level of caring um, came through and, and mattered. Thank you. Yeah, there, there are several instances, uh, notably Princeton, where he rode out between the lines and uh, at one point, uh, it said that one of his aides took his hat off and covered his face because he didn't want to see uh, <laughs> Washington killed. And after the volley had been fired by the British, uh, he was still there on his horse. So he, uh, he was in some ways blessed. No, we should never ignore the influence of luck <laughs> in life. <laughs> Good. Okay, our second question is from Lee Popham of the Florida Society. At the time of his inauguration as the last, first president of the United States, General George Washington was wearing his Masonic apron and he placed his hand on the Bible of the Grand Lodge of New York as he took the oath of office. How big a role did the concepts and teachings of Freemasonry have in Washington's everyday life, in his leadership qualities and in the formation of the basic precepts of the United States of America? I tried very hard to figure the right answer out to this question as I was working on the book because, it, you know, he does meet with Masons every now and again. And, you know, there is a certain set of legends about his engagement with the Masons. It is true that he took his oath of office on a Masonic Bible, but that seems to have been an accident. Um, he, he showed up at the then... Uh, Capitol building in New York City and nobody had a Bible. And there was a Mason there who said, well, you know, I, I can grab one from our office. Uh, so it's hard to see that as, as a big step. Um, he did wear his Masonic apron at the, not at his swearing in, but at the laying of the foundation stone of the Capitol, which I think that's 1793. I find a little odd. Um, 
it's a private organization and he's there as uh, the president. But you have to conclude it meant something to him. Um, he was actually engaged in the activities of a Mason, uh, a small M Mason. Uh, so maybe it just felt appropriate to him. But in his life and his correspondence, I can't really find that it, it made a whole lot of difference to him. He joined as a very young man in Frederick, you know, Fredericksburg. Uh, it was a place where you would go to make connections with influential and powerful people in the, in the community. And he was an ambitious guy and he wanted to do that. Uh, I think he kept it up because he thought it was a useful organization and maybe he liked being able to connect with people through it. But there's no real trace that the Masonic principles or uh, any part of the organization was central or even terribly important to him. All right, thank you. Um, our next question is from Chris Christo of the Maryland Society. Why were Washington's religious behaviors prominently promoted when his own writings lack any support of a life of a religious person? Is that the story of the solitary praying in the woods, the infrequent visits to a church in his, in his own notes, his use of providence in most speeches, et cetera. With his tremendous accomplishments, why did biographers feel the need to promote his, this myth of an extremely religious man over the emphasis of his military and strategic accomplishments, his character as a man and his fellowship with his men? There's two parts of this very interesting question. One is, why do historians write what they write, especially when they get it wrong? Uh, and a lot of that is, uh, you know, we are the products of our own cultures. And, you know, in Victorian times, leaders had to be pious, gen genuflecting religious people. That was what we wanted from them. And you know, they weren't all with that way, of course, but that was the public story. And so they in, injected that into, into Washington and it wasn't accurate. Um, so, you know, it's as though it's like today, you could not write a book today about Washington without addressing slavery. Um, you could in 1860, it just, you know, that wasn't the issue that people cared about with respect to Washington. Um, there's all, so, so the culture is powerful in the historian and we need to be aware of that. Uh, I do think Washington's religious life is interesting. Uh, he had an unquestioned belief in God. He did refer to providence or different uh, euphemisms, you might call them, you know, the maker of the universe, that sort of thing, the great disposer of events. And, and plainly, he thought there was a central force. Um, but he never spoke of Christ. Uh, it's, it's just not there. Um, and I don't know the significance of that. I can only observe it. He was very devoted though to the idea of organized religion. He emphasized this a number of times that that was an essential construct of society, that it taught people morality and it led to moral behavior. So he wasn't being unchristian, but he was just not talking about Christian principles in public. Uh, and there is a final oddness, which uh, I spent way too much time trying to figure out, which was, he, he of course was Anglican, which most uh, people in Virginia were at the time. Uh, and he adopted a practice uh, after a number of years. He, he was, uh, I think it was not until he was uh, in his forties of leaving the service uh, when it was time for communion. And he would stand up and leave. And, you know, of course, he was a prominent member of the community and he was taller than everybody in the place. So, he, you know, everybody noticed when Washington left and they're, they're wonderful recollections by a couple of ministers who hated this. They were very angry about this because he they thought it was setting a bad example for the, the, the flock. Um, and at least one writer has speculated that maybe he did it because he was realizing that he was engaged in the sin of slavery and he didn't feel like he could come to communion with a clear conscience uh, in that condition, which is an interesting idea, but it, it has no basis, uh, no evidential basis. 
And then a friend who grew up in Virginia told me that, well, you know, a lot of Virginians leave before the communion. <laughs> that was a pattern. Um, uh, so I, I don't know what to make of it, but it, 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 it you know, was, uh, he, he was open to other religions. He had no religious prejudice. He wrote a famous letter to the Jews of uh, Rhode Island uh, respecting their religion. Um, and I, I, he, near as we can, as I can tell, he just thought it was a personal matter. Our next question from John V. Richardson, Jr. of the California Society. What are the prospects for any new historiography of George Washington's early life? And what is the likelihood of finding new sources for his early life? Well, those are two different questions. The likelihood of new sources is, is low. Um, people have been scrounging for Washington stuff for a long time. The Washington Papers Project, which has been going on for 70 years, uh, is now doing Martha's Papers, which is long overdue, but there aren't too many of them. Um, and if we're gonna find anything new, I think it will be in peripheral figures, maybe somebody like the Fairfax family, which was very important to him. And they might have some stuff stashed away over in England or somewhere, or, or maybe descendants of Washington uh, will have things from, he had a number of siblings and uh, their papers have been pillaged by people looking for anything interesting, but I, I wouldn't expect anything from him, but you know, folks have stuff in their attics that they don't know is there. So you can't rule it out, but a slim possibility. The possibility for new hist historiography, you know, that term, I'm not totally sure of, but it does, it's always possible to look at a historical figure in a different way and to notice things. Uh, you know, he's got more than 60 volumes of published papers and they've been accessible to everybody. But, you know, when you're reading 60 volumes, which I did, um, you can miss something. <laughs> you can pass over something. You get a little numb at a certain point. And someone else may notice that, hey, this is actually important. So I do think an, a significant life like Washington's that was noticed and people did observe it and record their views of it, um, there is gonna, gonna continue to be uh, interesting historical takes on what uh, he did and who he was. What if any new primary sources did you find while doing your research? Uh, you know, I'd have to say not, I, I don't think I found new primary sources. Uh, I went to sources that people weren't looking at. Uh, in particular, uh, I was very interested in this period in the House of Burgesses, his wilderness years. Uh, and there are, I mean, they're online, the, the records of the House of Burgesses. And they're interesting. Uh, you have to sort of piece them together. They're not easy to get through. And there are also some records from the Fairfax County Court, which are interesting, that show him engaged in different activities. Uh, so those were things I haven't seen uh, dealt with in any of the other uh, significant books on Washington. Uh, because I think mostly people have skipped over that period. I think they've undervalued how significant it was in his development. Uh, so uh, that's what I would emphasize is different. But again, a, a lot of the, the art of history is how you put it together. Even things we know, um, it, it may not be a brand new fact, but if you turn it a certain way, it, it sheds light that we didn't have before. Okay, question number five is Guy Higgins of the International Society. Historians always speak of motivations in terms that look good in history books, but are frequently hard for ordinary people to see themselves living up to. So these days, our founding fathers almost seem like demigods. I'm curious about your thoughts on how much Washington was motivated by his massive land grants in the Ohio Territory that became worthless after the passage of the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Well, there's a few things about that uh, question, and it's an interesting part of his life. Um, he was terribly focused on land and out west. He thought that's where he would become rich, and uh, ultimately it wasn't. Uh, 
as an old man, he, he writes, you know, boy, what a mistake that was. Uh, he assembled about 50,000 acres out there and never made much, any money out of it, frankly, any real money. Uh, the proclamation line of 1763 annoyed him, but he thought it was such a stupid policy that it wouldn't last. So I don't think it, you know, it was just one more annoyance from the British government. And he was pretty soured on the British after the French and Indian War and his experience there. He had tried to get an appointment in the British Army. They had treated him with the, you know, snobbery and condescension that the British have always been excellent at. Um, and he uh, uh, was not predisposed in their favor. Uh, and this was another factor, but I wouldn't call it uh, critical. Uh, I think uh, his experience out West though was terribly important um, for framing him. Uh, he had a sense of the potential of the continent and all the land that was out there. And, and he was out there both in the war and then he took two long trips out there when he was basically prospecting for land. Um, and he had a real vision. Uh, he may not have been a great orator, but he was a great visionary and he had a vision of a great uh, country that could be built, which was, I think, fundamentally different from a lot of the other founders uh, who you know, really clung to the East Coast that's where the people were. Um, so the, the West was very important in framing him as a political leader. Uh, I think the proclamation line a little less so. <laughs> Our next question uh, is from Tom Keese of the Virginia Society. To what degree was George Washington a larger than life figure during his lifetime? How charismatic and inspirational was he? As context, his legacy and lore were such that many a later tale, throwing a dollar across the Potomac River, chopping down a cherry tree as a youth, motivating the Continental Army to persevere amidst hardships, grew after his death. Well, the myths are ridiculous, and they were created by Carson Weems, who thought it was good to make stuff up. Um, it, it, it's, we've been digging out for them for years, and they're still the things that a lot of people know about him and not much more, which is a little disappointing. Um, he was, he had great presence. Uh, again, it's a hard thing to recreate for someone who's no longer here and you can't experience it. But, you know, he was six foot two at a time when people were a lot shorter. Uh, there's a wonderful source I found that reviewed all of his regiment, uh, physical qualities of his regiment in uh, the French and Indian War. And the average height was five foot five. Uh, and there were only uh, 500 soldiers. There were only seven who were six feet tall. So he was big um, and he was athletic and he had great poise in what in the 18th century they called a dress. He knew how to behave. He knew how to move. He always loved to go to the theater and watch actors. He was a performer and he cared a lot about his clothes he always made sure he looked good. And that's all part of how you create that image. And again, something again that, you know, I hadn't thought of about him that came through to me through the research was after the Revolutionary War, whenever he enters a town, if he's on there on business, whatever he's there for, if he's going to Richmond, if he's going to Annapolis, if he's wherever he, those little towns, the town goes wild. They start ringing the church bells. They start blasting the cannons. He's, he, he's kind of funny in North Carolina. Once he enters a little town and he says, they gave me as much of a cannonade as they could with one cannon. Um, and they, you know, they set off fireworks that they have them. They put illuminations in the windows of the house at night. Houses at night, um, they present petitions and uh, proclamations. I mean, he, he's God. And it's very impressive to me that it doesn't seem to turn his head. He doesn't get full of himself, um, which, you know, it could be tiresome to have people do all that every time you're coming to town and trying to get something done. But also, 
You know, there are a lot of people that could turn their heads and, and it did not. Um, he was a grounded personality. And I, I think that uh, sort of built our expectation of what a leader of president should be, someone who is modest, someone who is self-effacing, which he always was. Uh, he had a sense of his own dignity and you wouldn't mistake that he thought well of himself and expected to be treated with respect, but he treated other people with respect always. And I think um, that was part of the myth. And it, 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 you know, we, not all of our leaders behave that way, but I think it is what we do expect. You go with the follow-up to that and you allude to it in the book. Uh, how do you think his um, love of the theater inspired his uh, sense of presence, his, his charisma and his, uh, um, the way he conducted himself on the, uh, the stage of politics? I think it sharpened all of those factors. Uh, he had the qualities before. He understood how important it was to look good and how important it was to present yourself well. But his passion for the theater, and you'd have to call it a passion. I mean, if he visited Williamsburg um, in, his, in the wilderness years, you know, he would go to five plays in seven days. I mean, he could not, anytime they had something on, he wanted to go. And he was learning, you know, that an actor knows how to stand, knows when to make eye contact, and knows when to look away, knows when to maybe wait a second and pause, make sure people are listening, or change the timber of his voice, or speak up more quickly or less quickly. So those were all things that I think Washington was taking on board from theatrical performances, and uh, he, he was avid in his appreciation for the theater. Our next question comes from Roger Swim of the Illinois Society. In John Avalon's Washington's Farewell, the Founding Fathers' Warning to Future Generations, he refers to the farewell address as Washington's autobiography of ideas. Would you agree that the address inculcates Washington's ideas of democracy, the presidency, the republic, in this carefully composed address to the nation as an autobiography of ideas. Well, I wanna say first, I, I think the Avalon book is a good book. Uh, I used it and, and learned from it. I think the term autobiography of ideas is opaque to me. I'm not sure what it means. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna walk, walk around that. Um, but I do think the farewell address is, it, first is a wonderful document. And secondly, is something people should still be reading. Um, it, it's longer than you expect. So I think that may be a reason why it's a bit fallen out of favor. Uh, but he delivers a, just a punishing description of the flaws, of the, the, the evils of partisanship. And he says quite clearly, look, we're gonna be partisans. That's what human, human beings are but we can't let it get out of control. It's a fire to be tended, not to be allowed to blaze away. Uh, he, he also talks about what I mentioned earlier, the importance of religion. He talks repeatedly about the importance of union, that the nation must remain unified, uh, must resist foreign wiles. Now there is a tendency to think of the farewell address as counseling us to avoid entangling alliances, which was the sense that he was giving. But unfortunately, he didn't use the term. <laughs> the term that comes from Jefferson's first inaugural. Um, Jefferson was good with words. Um, he also, it, this gets ignored, he makes it very clear that, he, that Americans need to pay their taxes. Um, it had been a problem, you know, he'd have the Whiskey Rebellion on his hands with people who didn't want to pay their taxes. And uh, he emphasized repeatedly, nobody likes taxes. And I, he didn't like them. He, he complained about the, the tax assessors in Virginia. He thought they were all thieves. But he also recognized that you can't have a government. You can't have an army. You can't defend yourself if 
and people aren't paying for it and you've got to do it. Um, and I think at the end of the day, his call for a virtuous and independent republic is in fact consistent with his career uh, and is, you know, just so essential for us in, in every, every time period we've been in. We have two questions from Rob Adams of the Florida Society, uh, and we'll do those sequentially. Uh, his first question is, did Washington envision a form of manifest destiny for the United States, one that would allow extra constitutional presidential actions like the Louisiana Purchase? Well, the phrase, of course, was not in currency at the time, but yes, you're correct that his notion was that there should be, and he, he didn't blink at using the term empire, that the United States should become a continental empire. Uh, it, it grew from his appreciation for how much nation there was out there um, in the West. Um, and he absolutely thought it was essential that we acquire those lands. Uh, and he believed in presidential power. Uh, you can see it in his approval of the Bank of the United States and his uh, reaction to the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, and he would, I think, not have had any trouble saying that the uh, uh, Louisiana Purchase was fine and should be completed. Um, I want to flag, though, that as president, he was vexed by the issue of the Indians. Um, he knew them better than maybe any president we've had except Andrew Jackson. Uh, he had fought against them, he had fought with them. And he knew they were there and they were there first. And how to deal with them bothered him a great deal. He didn't make much progress at it, but he had an acute sense that the white settlers were often unfair, violently unfair to Indians and that the, as a nation, we had to be fair with them. And he, he, he attempted to be. Uh, again, I'd have to say that's not necessarily a legacy. He didn't leave a great legacy on it because I, he had other things he was more focused on, um, but it, it was something that troubled him a great deal. Okay, and, and maintaining that theme rolls right into Rob's second question. Did Washington's experience with fellow slaveholders, as well as anti-slavery Northerners, provide him any visions of how slavery would play out in the U.S.? You know, his generation worried about this problem. Um, we've learned in the last 30, 40 years of paying attention to the issue that they were troubled by it. Um, and they sometimes they engaged in a certain sort of magical thinking that, well, it would just go away um, somehow. And I think Washington was far too hard headed to think that was true. Uh, he never would have su supported secession. The union was essential to him. Um, so you can put that out of your mind. Um, he, as a young man, I think is not sensitive to the slavery issue. I think the Revolutionary War makes him uh, sensitive to it largely because of the black soldiers, African-American soldiers, you know, are, are dying for his liberty. And, you know, he, he has to confront that he owns people like them and it's wrong. And he knows it's wrong. He spends some time trying to be a good slaveholder, which is, you know, an oxymoron. It, it, you can't be a good slaveholder. Then he spends a lot of years trying to figure out a way to get rid of his slaves, and that's not a phrase I should use, but how to ex extricate himself from slave owning. Uh, he, for the country, he kept saying he thought there should be a legislative solution. And the Northern states were starting to adopt these gradual emancipation laws, which would, over a course of many years, as many as 30 or 40, generations of slaves would become uh, emancipated and ultimately that is how slavery disappears in the North. He hopes that they will, that will be followed nationwide. It's not gonna be because there are so many more slaves in the South and there's just too many people whose wealth is tied up in it. Um, it's not the same as, you know, having 
you know, a few thousand slaves uh, get their freedom in Pennsylvania or New York. So that I find somewhat uh, disingenuous of him to wait for that. He never publicly endorses those laws. He never publicly opposes slavery, which I think is a failure. Um, and it's a sad one. Um, I think he may, he probably thought it was, would have been pointless. It wouldn't make any difference. And he would just tick off a lot of people and uh, reduce his own effectiveness. Uh, but I think it was the major moral question facing us as a nation and, and our, our greatest leader ducked it. Now he did uh, free his slaves in his will. Uh, it was a complicated situation in Mount Vernon because a majority of the slaves actually had been owned or, or descended from slaves owned by Martha Washington's first husband. They were the dower slaves, the Custis slaves. And he could not release those unless he purchased them and he had to buy them from the estate. And he never had enough money to do that. He tried to raise the money, but all the land he had out West turned out he couldn't sell. So uh, he finally just threw up his hands and said, okay, I'm, I'm saying this, he said it to himself, I'll free the ones I can free. And those were the ones he owned, it was more than a hundred. And he did in his uh, will and they were uh, emancipated. Uh, I think it was an act of atonement for him. Uh, at one point he says, I hope this would not be displeasing to my maker. Um, I, I think he would have liked it if it had solved, served a, as a model for the country, but I don't think it, he was the kind of idealistic guy who expected that to happen. He always thought people followed their own self-interest and that for slaveholders, uh, freeing your slaves was taking on a big economic hit and he didn't expect them to do it. And, and what did Martha do with her slave people um, at the end of her life? Well, it's kind of two steps. She, uh, uh, Washington uh, provided that his slaves would not be freed until she died, which proved to be a very awkward provision because uh, Martha was very nervous that the slaves who were owned, had been owned by Washington wanted her dead. And there was a tradition, and I use the term intentionally, of uh, slaves poisoning their masters. <laughs> James Madison's grandfather had been poisoned by his slaves. Um, so she, she was scared. And so she arranged to free them early. Uh, she did not free her own slaves. She could not legally. Um, it was not permitted. And they were inherited by her four grandchildren. Um, one of them, uh, uh, Eliza, the eldest, uh, was married to a fellow named Thomas Law, and they emancipated, it's hard to tell which of them was doing it, uh, maybe a dozen slaves, maybe more. Uh, we know that Wash Custis, the one male grandson, uh, also emancipated at least one or two slaves, a favored slave that was not uncommon. Um, and there's not much evidence that the others ever were emancipated. A final question is sort of a, a wrap up and gets back to the theme of the book. How did George Washington's experiences as a wartime commander in chief dealing with the Continental Congress under the Articles of Confederation influence his beliefs in a strong central government and the role of the chief executive, both during the Constitutional Convention and during his presidency? Uh, they were pivotal. Uh, he fought that war without enough money, without enough troops, and without enough supplies. And it wasn't that Congress didn't want to support him. It wasn't that the states didn't want to support him. It was that nobody had any money. And, you know, times were bad. And the organization, you know, the governmental structures were not strong enough to produce what the nation needed really to field a, a strong army. Uh, and, you know, we did the best we could. It was eight-year improvisation. Uh, but he was 
maddened, and I think it's the right word, by the weakness of the federal government, the, or the, what central government there was. And then again, after the war, uh, when the economic conditions are terrible, we don't even have a single currency. We're still mostly using British pounds. You know, we win the war, but we're still using their money. This is embarrassing at best. We're using Portuguese money. We're using Spanish money. I mean, it, it, we're not really quite a country. Uh, the states are fighting with each other. And it, it is not sustainable. There was open speculation that the, we would fall apart into three different uh, confederacies, uh, New England and the middle states and the South, maybe even the West would uh, secede. So that's why he comes out of retirement to the Constitutional Convention. He knows that without a real government, uh, and he describes what we had as the mere shadow of a government, without a real government, you're just not gonna have a country. And this great experiment in self-government, which has meant so much to him. I mean, he, I haven't talked much about it, but he, he believed in the cause. He believed idealistically that that was the best way for people to live together, to have a structure where they governed themselves. And he decided that even though he preferred Mount Vernon, he would come back into public life uh, to try to make that happen. Uh, and I think he would, you know, I've described him a few times as ambitious. That was another of his ambitions. He knew that would be an amazing achievement. And he wanted to, you know, I think at his heart of hearts, he wanted to give that a try. All right. Well, thank you very much. And on behalf of President General Jack Manning, the headquarters and education outreach staff and the 37,000 members of the Sons of the American Revolution, I'd like to thank you for taking time to talk to us today. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Brooks. Thank you. Appreciate that. And to find out where to get this book and more about his other historic, historical works, Madison's Gift, Five Partnerships That Built America, American Emperor, Aaron Burr's Challenge to Jefferson's America, and Impeached, The Trial of President Andrew Johnson and the Fight for Lincoln's Legacy, or David's Frazier and Cook Historical Mysteries, The Lincoln Deception, about the John Wilkes Booth Conspiracy, which has been called the best historic, historical novel of 2013 by the Bloomberg Review, The Paris Deception, set at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, and the Babe Ruth deception, which followed the Babe's first two years with the Yankees, or his newest fictional series, The Overstreet Saga, please visit the website at www.davidostewart.com. <laughs>